Hey guys, so we're here with Robin Marklin. He's an OG in the reptile world and uh, he's an entrepreneur. He has a whole bunch of things going on. He has some new stuff going on and we're going to talk about some awesome animals. So guys, stay tuned. You're going to get a lot of information out of this one. Alright guys, so if you guys don't know who Robin is, uh, he used to be one of the owners at Pro Exotics. He uh, was an owner at Ship Your Reptiles. He is starting a new company now and uh, he's done a ton of things. You've been, how long have you been in the, the hobby, in the, the industry really? We actually just hit uh, 25 years. 25 years of experience right here. 1993, that's not even this century. <laughs> that's, that's true. Like, it goes back to the last century. A that's bunch of our viewers story. weren't even born yet, to be honest. That's true. <laughs> Ryan back there, he's not, he, was a, he wasn't even born. Young Just, pup. He was a pup. <laughs> so, now what's, you know what's crazy is 25 years, it is a long time. Seems like a long time. Mm -hmm. um, but there's literally people in our hobby, in our world, that have been in double that time. Oh, yeah. Yeah, you know, sure. Before I was born. Like, yeah. You know, people keeping reptiles in the 60s. Mm -hmm. Uh, even yeah. in the 50s, uh, yeah. it's pretty wild when you take a broad look at it and try to understand how long people have been at this. So yeah. 25 years, long time. Yeah, yeah. very much. And, but there's definitely yeah. folks that have put in a lot more time than I have. Yeah, and I think sometimes also it's the, the quality of the time too because we've, sure. been in, we've been doing it for like nine years or so and we would say we're no experts. In, in ball pythons is mostly what we do. We do blue tongue snakes and old world rat snakes a bit. Yeah. We are not experts. And I think sometimes if you devote like a ton of time. I mean, you were like all in for 25 years, most of that 25 years, all in. And we're like, mostly, I mean, we have real jobs outside of this and right. you know, it's tough and we divide the time. We talk about that all the time. And so for people out there that are, you know, making that decision or wanting to make that decision, you can do so much more with your, your, your small business um, and the hobby and the industry. If you really devote all the time, and this would be like an example of that where, you know, if you're just kind of splitting it and we talk about that, you know, like, so I think it's a lot of the quality as well. So you've been in like, and have done a lot, 25 years, Yeah. you know, you've been all over the world. You're like seeing awesome stuff. Well, when I started in 93, I didn't know it was going to become a career. Mm -hmm. I was open, you know, I was delivering pizzas. I was making Subway sandwiches, mm -hmm. I was working at the music store. Yeah. Just, you know, nonsense, young guy jobs that you're just kind of figuring out where you want to be and what you want to do. And I had the opportunity to get into the reptile side on the breeding side. Mm -hmm. And I just thought, oh, that sounds fun and interesting and exciting. I didn't know that it was going to become a career. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, I'm fortunate that all of my jobs and all of my businesses from that point have been reptile related. Yeah. So whether it's as pro exotics, doing livestock, breeding animals, breeding all kinds of snakes and lizards and everything else, um, to ship your reptiles, mm -hmm. which became ship your aquatics. Mm -hmm. um, so we, you know, aquatic shipping as well. To then the reptile report. Yep. Um, Huge on and Facebook. And then now I'm, I just started a new company called Redline Science, and we're doing now going to do products. Okay. So we've done the livestock side. We've done the breeding side. And when I say we, it's because I always have a team. Yeah. You know, it's never me by myself. It's always uh, partners or a team that's, you know, supporting mm -hmm. uh, what we're doing. So livestock, uh, then the shipping, you know, service mm -hmm. side. Uh, Reptile Report is more informational and mm -hmm. social media side. Absolutely. And then now uh, Redline Science is going to be product side. Yeah. So it's interesting the way things evolve, mm -hmm. but it was always great that everything stayed within the reptile world, you know? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, so, all right, so you have a, a new a new business you're talking about, um, Redline Science. Yep. So what exactly are you guys gonna be doing? I know it's really, really young. It, so. it is really young. I mean, it's, uh, we're mid-March here, and I literally created the company not a month ago. Okay. So it's brand new. Fresh, right off the presses. Yes, it is, it is a fresh hot donut. Um, Again, I'm working with some really great partners, mm -hmm. um, and we're going to kind of leverage our connections, experience, mm -hmm. our reach um, to maximize effectiveness of the new product business. So Redline Science, what I want to do is uh, heating, lighting, 
mm -hmm. uh, tools and other products, mm -hmm. but we're going to do it on a little bit wider look and, and do it for uh, reptiles, aquatics, and also horticulture. So, okay. you know, the plant world. Mm -hmm. um, so I want to be able to provide, you know, heating, lighting tools, etc., for those three industries. And I thought that was a good fit because when I really looked at those three industries, there's a lot of parallels between oh, them. Oh, yeah. You know, they're all, there's a lot of hobbyist-driven business mm -hmm. in those three worlds. Just like in the reptile world, in the aquatics world, there are folks that do, like, home-based breeding of fish and corals, mm -hmm. where they're literally breeding corals in their spare bedroom or their mm -hmm. basement or their garage. Yeah. Or maybe a small outbuilding. And then they're selling them online mm -hmm. in forums and on social media, and then they're shipping them to their customers all around the country. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, and oddly enough, there's also a segment of that world where it's like the wild caught segment, right? So I mean, yeah. there's captive production, and then there's folks that you know bring in wild corals and fish from around the world and and ship them out to that to the coral and fish folks, yeah. which is just like the reptile world. You, yeah. know, you have your captive red reptile folks. Um, wild caught stuff is is a lot diminished than it was say in the 90s yeah but yeah so those so parallels are still there mm -hmm. and which gives me familiarity for those different markets same with the plant world you know there's a yeah. lot of hobbyist driven small folks producing plants um, and you know selling them out in the world and they all kind of need similar items heating lighting tools mm -hmm. um, tweak differently for each of those markets sure uh, but I thought there was an opportunity to make this an entirely new adventure. Yeah. And uh, like I said, work with some really cool folks like yeah. I can't yet talk about, but uh, <laughs> <It's all right. laughs> once we get it all hammered out and, and, and ready to roll, yeah. which would be probably summer of 2020 here, mm -hmm. um, it's gonna be very exciting. Yeah, and so the, and I know we've talked a lot, you know, offline of, of this. And so your, your focus is, you know, how do you help and with your experience and all of your knowledge um, and it's not just you, it's all the combined people that you're working with, yeah. you know, to help grow your reptiles, grow your aquatics and grow your, your horticulture, your plants. Yeah. And so it's all things to help grow. And really at, on our side of it, knowing how to do that more efficiently and understanding, you know, what each segment needs helps us grow our business and helps us grow our passion and grow our, our, uh, our experience, our, our, you know, our point of view and the things that we want to do. So yeah. it's funny how it, it crosses over. Like this is your drive that helps us, you know? So I think it's a great idea. You know, obviously yeah. there's a lot of things I want to talk to you about outside of the business stuff. But um, part of this is the reason I want to do this is because of just your, your business mind and understanding your scope of what you want to do is super interesting to me. Yeah. And, and ever since I was a little kid, I, I always wanted to be an entrepreneur for, for the younger folks out there that are not sure what they want to do after high school or after college, um, but you, you know you might have an inkling of it. I had no idea, but I knew I wanted to be an entrepreneur, mm -hmm. and so that that has been consistent throughout my life, and that's what I enjoy the most. And you know, to touch on the grow thing, literally in the new Redline Science logo, there's a line that says "grow, grow, 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 grow," uh, yeah. and I thought that really spoke to me because yes, it applies to helping people grow reptiles, helping people grow aquatics, helping people grow plants. Mm -hmm. And then, a, you know, kind of a side passion of mine is I love to talk about business. I love to talk about uh, logistics, about infrastructure, about how things get done. Mm -hmm. And I love to help people grow their own businesses. Like through the Reptile Report, we support hundreds and hundreds of yeah. breeders and small hobbyists, right? And, and give them access to a wider market than they're able to access on oh, their yeah, own. For sure. And that goes back to, to the growth thing. Like yeah. I want to help people succeed. The, the thing I love to do is help good people do great work. If you're, if you're a, a strong character, strong uh, um, driven person and you're busting your ass and you're mm -hmm. doing some good stuff, I love to support that. Yeah, And that's really, again, goes back to like the reptile report that lets me do that. Or ship your reptiles that, that we, we're able to support folks in getting their animals and their merchandise out to their customers mm -hmm. at a better rate and more discounted and with the right packaging and everything else that they could get on their own. So we're, that's an underlying theme for yeah. you know, a lot of my career is to try and help small businesses or hobbyists grow and, and do their own things. And I get That's a lot great. of satisfaction out of that. 
That's great. That's yeah. great. It's cool. Yeah. So yeah, so you know, after you guys see this, you're gonna have to check them out. They're still building until the summer, so this video definitely come out before the summer, but they're still building, so keep an eye on them. And uh, we'll probably do updates at some point, you know, sure. see where, where the new business is going. Um, so we're excited about that, and I appreciate you talking about that, and I appreciate your passion. Um, so I gotta pick your brain on some of the, the, I mean, you've worked with some awesome, crazy animals that some of them, you know, aren't really even accessible to people anymore, you know, and I think uh, just unbelievable. So. Talk, can you talk just just a one minute spiel about pro exotics? I mean, I know a lot of people see that I wear my pro exotic shirt like all the time. I, and I <laughs> noticed that, and I appreciate that. Yeah, so it's cool um, when you go to shows and see you know pro exotics gear and stuff yeah, being yeah. worn. So pro exotics is what we started in mm -hmm. 1993 with my partner yeah. Chad, um, and we had that until 2011. Okay, we were a livestock breeder. We worked with all kinds of different animals over the years. Um, we did, you know, all kinds of snakes, all kinds of lizards, you know. Um, it's funny because back in the 90s, we weren't as smart. Yeah. We're still kind of learning the ropes and trying to figure this all out, right? The reptile breeding and propagation. Oh, yeah. And so, I mean, there was times in the 90s we were trying to do everything. And that's the most difficult way to do it. Mm. You try and breed everything. You, if you're trying to do everything, you can do everything mediocrely. Yeah. As opposed to if you focus on one or two things, you can do those excellently. Mm -hmm. But yeah, if you try and do everything, it kind of just kind of gets muddy. But I mean, we did corn snakes, king snakes, milk snakes, um, all types of different boas. Uh, we did all kinds of different pythons. We did giant pythons, African rock pythons, that mm -hmm. you know, big ones that chase my staff out of the room sometimes. <laughs> uh, we did retich. We did berms. Mm -hmm. um, and then we did a, a bunch of different monitors from, you know, small ones up to big ones. And then a bunch of different species of geckos. Mm -hmm. um, as the 2000s rolled around, we learned those lessons on, again, being mediocre at everything and having okay production mm -hmm. to having better focus on particular species mm -hmm. so you could have great production and great success. That's a pro tip for you guys, for real. Go on. There's only so much mental energy you can put into a project. Yeah. You know, you only have, it's not like literal brain cells that are functioning, but you only have so much focus that you can have. That you can and so out, the, yeah. the wider you make it, the more difficult it's going to be. Yeah, and I think something that people don't realize is um, to really keep an animal correctly and in the right spot. Sometimes, and we talked about this with Ryan McVeigh uh, just the other day, you have these m micro habitats almost. So to keep m two different types of monitors, even in the same room sometimes, is very, very difficult. Just because be of challenging. The, yeah, just because of the environmental challenges that you would have. And so people try to spread it out like, oh, I really love this animal, I love this animal, but I really only have like a two bedroom apartment. It, and it that's cool. Done, that's though. cool if it's, if your it's the goal is just to keep them and enjoy them, right? Which is a fine goal. Oh, absolutely. You know, there's a lot of purity to that. Just keeping and enjoying the animals versus, well, I have to breed this and I have to make more of these, and I gotta breed this one. I gotta, you know, grow this part of the group and breed, 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 and then I'm gonna make money. I'm gonna become a millionaire. <laughs> and almost nobody does that. It's very yeah. difficult to make money uh, breeding reptiles. Very challenging. Well, but there's uh, there's a reason that the best chameleon, chameleons out there on the market come from chameleon breeders. Yep. They're focused just on chameleons. Mm -hmm. They're not also breeding milk snakes and they're not also breeding monitors and they're also not breeding Burmese pythons. Yeah. yeah. You know, they're breeding just chameleons and, and holy moly, there are some world-class <laughs> chameleon breeders that make <coughs> unbelievable stuff that just blows your mind. Yeah. And same with uh, my good friend Matt Most. Yeah. Right? He does love that guy. amazing <laughs> rat snakes. Yep. Asian rat snakes. And some of my favorite species. Um, and that's his concentration. And he kicks ass at doing that. Yeah. But yeah, he doesn't also have, you know, berms on the side or African rocks or, you know, he's not also trying to be a water <laughs> yeah. monitor breeder. Right? Yeah, he's, yeah. he's focused on that. And that's how you can achieve excellence yeah. uh, is to focus. That, and, that helps out a lot. And uh, to clarify what you're saying about that making money, you can make money at reptiles. You can. You got to work at it. And there's very few people are making the millions, but you can easily make this a real job. Like, you can make it a, a good job, for yeah. sure. 
Yeah. But I see a lot of people come in and they literally think, I'm going to make a million dollars on this. Yeah. And that's, that's very difficult. Right. The right. quickest way to make a million dollars in reptiles is to start with two million dollars. Yep. And just work your way down. And, the, <laughs> and buy a whole bunch of rats and sell them. Because <laughs> breeding, <laughs> breeding the food. Hey, well, yeah. now I do know some very successful rodent breeders. Oh no! There's breeding money the to be made. In rodent that's breeding. what I'm saying. You can you can make money in the food. There's money to be made breeding cockroaches. Oh yeah! If that's what you're gonna do, and focus on it. Yeah, yeah absolutely. I know some really <laughs> successful cockroach breeders. And, and frankly, frankly, some of the breeders. some of the biggest bre some of the biggest companies in the reptile world are cricket breeders. Oh yeah! Just breeding. Yeah. Billions of crickets. We always joke that Ryan Goodman is uh, Todd Goodman's nephew. We say that all the time. I didn't know that. <laughs> no, he's not. He's yeah. not. He won't even oh, take him in. Well, I heard you him say it, and you were there, so I'm pretty sure it's true. You guys get free crickets? <laughs> I'm sure we could, but all I don't the time. Know. I'm expecting a delivery in a couple of weeks. <laughs> you got to put in your request. Yeah. So it, there's funny. there's value in that focus part. Oh yeah, specialty for sure. Specializing. Yeah. Uh, but I mean, sometimes that's super challenging because there's so many cool animals to work with. <laughs> yeah. You know, for sure. Um, the chameleon thing, I, I do love chameleons. I think they're really gorgeous. Mm -hmm. um, I'm good just to view it in pictures and videos or at the show. Mm -hmm. I'm never going to try and keep a chameleon because it's just out of my box. Yeah. It's not what I do. But I was really into monitor lizards. I was mm -hmm. passionate about doing those. Um, you know, it, in 2011, uh, this is like old time history at this point because yeah. time flies and people forget and move on, and that's fine. But in 2011, we had a facility fire at Pro Exotics, and it wiped us out. It completely took away the whole collection yeah. in the matter of a couple hours. Thousands and thousands of animals, and that was it. Yeah. That was uh, very earth-shattering. And, uh, and for everybody in the reptile world, really, to be honest. It was, it was, it was an tough. event. Yes, yeah. It was an event in the reptile world. Um, I mean, it's, at this point, it's a life event. Yeah. You know? Um, that that helped us to refocus you know i'd already done 20 years of animals to that point so we had to you know we had to think about what what to do next mm -hmm. and i thought i i can't do the animals again breeding wise mm -hmm. you know and especially at that time my heart was literally broken yeah and it was too difficult to think of trying to rebuild what we had done can i and ask so, it? i know it's tough but how many animals roughly um, to I don't remember a part, offhand, but it's probably three thousand, maybe. That's a lot. It was thousands of animals. Yeah. Tons. Yeah, it's it's crazy. Yeah, and see now, see, I don't think about it that often. Now you're yeah. making me think about no, it. It's, it's all right. It makes me kind of sad. Right. But so anyway, we yeah, stopped was, working with those in, in 2011. My the decision was made for me. Right. I wasn't going to be doing animals anymore, and that's why we focused on the shipping side, and I created the reptile report. You know to. What can we do to stay in the industry and move forward? Yeah. But in our animal days, um, going back to like, I, I'm never going to keep a chameleon because it's just not my thing. I can appreciate it. But like the monitor lizards, I was super into, very passionate about, mm -hmm. and I still follow today, and I still love that type of animal. What's, the, your, what's your favorite? Well, I think, personally, that the number one captive lizard species is the red ackies. Okay. I, okay. I didn't expect that. Okay. Yeah. Well, because, uh, and we've done big animals. We've done, yeah. you know, we, I busted my butt for decades to sell the very best water monitors in the country. Yeah. And I also really love the blackthroat monitor. Oh, they're so cool. Yes. <laughs> but blackthroat is a solid five foot animal. Yeah. Water monitor is a six foot plus animal. Yep. And they can tear you up if you don't <laughs> if you don't treat them right. Well, there's, you know? I mean, they a lot of times they'll tame down really, really well. They were mm -hmm. really personable. But as I looked at it, as far as you can't just sell stuff and that makes you happy. It, yeah. it has to be something you're passionate about. Absolutely. Yeah. And it has to satisfy your soul, right? Yeah. And so I thought these water monitors that I'm sending out, am I sending them to the best possible scenario? Is, is the people that I'm selling to are going to give a big 10, 12 foot, 15 foot cage for a large water monitor. Yeah. And I, I couldn't sleep well with that. Mm -hmm. And I, that, that hurt me a little bit. 
And that's also why we got out of doing berms and African rocks and all the giant snakes, retics, because I was just, I didn't feel, I didn't have to participate mm -hmm. in that. And it doesn't matter if I do or not. Whether or not Pro Exotic sold water monitors, whether we sold berms, there's still plenty in the market. You can go a yeah. hundred places and buy those animals if that's for you. Mm -hmm. But I thought, you know what? I'm going to focus on some other species that I think make better choices. Mm -hmm. And so in the 90s, late 90s, that's when the, the Aki monitors, uh, the red Acanthurus, it's an uh, Australian dwarf monitor species, they started becoming available um, and started working with them, super, super rewarding. Mm -hmm. I mean, most of our adults were 20 inches, tip to tail, mm -hmm. 24 would be a big animal, mm -hmm. and they were social. So you could do them in groups, yeah. you know, male, two females. Well, they did fair, fine as a pair, but you could do two females, you could do three females. You didn't have to have a 15 foot cage. So you could do a small cage that most everybody could, could provide ideal proper housing for them. Okay. So they were super social, real easy to work with. They were mini tanks, they were super hardy. And then if you were interested in breeding them, it was a great breeding project. Super prolific, uh, mm -hmm. fun, easy way to, to learn to breed monitors. So that was my number one choice overall. Yeah, for, for a, a and monitor. they're an intelligent species. I think all, all monitors are, are fun to fun to play with. Yeah, yeah. They, the interactivity you get with monitors over snakes yeah. makes a big difference mm -hmm. to me. Like you know, snakes just to kind of they hang out, and do their thing. But monitors, once the monitor looks you in the eye, yeah, and does his little head movements to try to figure out what you're doing and who you are and what you're mm -hmm. about. Yeah. That kind of interaction is really fascinating. They have a lot more personality. And the Akis, they can be freaking bonkers. Yeah. You know, they run all over the cage, they, they goof around with each other. It's just a really fun species yeah. to do. So if somebody's looking to get into a lizard species, I always recommend Akis first choice. Mm. Bearded dragons are fine choice, but there's a billion of them out there. Yep. And it's a great little lizard, for sure. Yeah. Similar size and everything. But if you want something that's different than that, and still breedable mm -hmm. and still makes a good project um, and fun and interactive. Yeah, hell yeah, go with the Ackies. Yeah. They're a blast. Yeah. And, and to go back to the money side, breeding Ackies, we could never breed enough of them to meet the demand. Yeah, you can definitely. You, you want to make some money in breeding lizards, you can still, to this day, breed Ackies and make money. Yeah. Assuming you don't lose your butt on caging, on food, yeah. on, you know, the animal getting out of the cage and running under the fridge, or the various, <laughs> you know, mistakes that people make. Right. Um, yeah, I mean, when we got out of breeding Ackies, I was selling them for two and a quarter a piece, 225 each. And now, like Brandon at Rare Earth, he's getting four or five hundred bucks a piece. I was going to bring him up, yeah. He's so a great guy. The, the, money, the money's gone up on Ackies because yeah. there's, there's just not that many people producing them. But what a fantastic species. Mm -hmm. Again, small, easy enough to keep, easy to handle, easy to work with, tons of yeah. personality. Um, yes, yeah, so Brandon Rarth does a really awesome job with those. Yeah, yeah. And we can put his description, or his link in the description below, too. He's, he's a great guy. Yeah, I, yeah, I, I love I, Brandon Lund. Yeah. Yeah. Real right. fun guy, smart dude. Yeah, for sure. What, all right, so what's your favorite snake species? Because it's it's one of ours too. But we snakes. Our um, I mean, so it's I have a similar approach on snakes, but it's mm -hmm. almost kind of reversed in that my favorite snake species is not a small species; it's a larger species. So it's I think. It's middle I think. Well, it's not. It's a large. It's not giant. It's not giant, right? Uh, it's Boland's pythons. Yeah. Number yeah. one overall snake species. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Who wouldn't love Boland's pythons? Agreed. Amazing. Mm-hmm. So, uh, again, we, as Pro Exotics, we started getting Boland's babies in the late 90s. Okay. And so, for those of you not clued in, maybe go search Boland's pythons and just spend an hour looking yeah, pictures. at the beauty of Boland's pythons. Yeah. Unbelievably gorgeous animal. But, with a few exceptions, nobody's really bred them. Yeah, and so very very difficult to produce. We've had this conversation at Tinley's and, and at other places. We're like, oh man, you know, nobody's really bred them, but oh, this guy in in like Costa Rica bred like thirteen or whatever. I don't know how many, and uh, it's like, yeah, but that was over a few clutches. Yeah, and so it's like only a few eggs per clutch, and really they should probably have in the how many you think like 18, 20 range. Oh gosh, um, well, 
like I said, it's a it's a large species. Our females were thirteen foot. Yeah. You know, they yeah. were that big around. And we used ultrasounds to take a look and see what was going on. Single most frustrating species. Because you get healthy, strong animals. They grow great. Oh, my God, they're great to handle. They're not aggressive. They're really cool. Mm. Um, and then we'd pair them up. We'd get courting. The males would spur the females. We'd get cops. You know, they would tie up for an hour, two hours at a time. And then using the ultrasound, you can, you know, use the ultrasound probe on the abdomen of the female. And you could see the follicles. Mm. And you could watch them develop. Yeah. And they would go from little, they, like little clumps of grapes mm -hmm. to big fat grapes. And then at the end of what we thought was going to be the breeding cycle to the lay cycle, it would look like stuffed marshmallows all yeah. the way up, like big 40 mil um, follicles that yeah, you could yeah. measure. And they were just jammed in there, lined up, and there would be 30 plus. Wow. And so I thought, number one, I thought, well, this is the year. Yeah. Definitely going to see eggs. I don't yeah. know if they're going to be viable or whatever, but there's no possible way all these follicles in this are not going to come out as eggs. Um, and there's going to be dozens of them. And literally over 15 years, we never got one egg. We <laughs> never got one egg. Not even That's a slug? Not even a slug. Wow. And we went through, I mean, you know, as you fine tune the breeding process, we went through a solid five or six, seven seasons where we saw that follicle development and we thought this has got to be the year this yeah. it's going to happen because and to this day i still don't understand what the catch is yeah there's some missing key there's some missing puzzle piece whether it's nutritional elevation uh temperatures mm -hmm. moisture there's something in there but yeah. with all the other species that we've produced and bred and the other breeders that have worked with like you know the process yeah, you cycle the, the animals, you put them together at the right time when the female is, is uh, ready and the male is, is ready to breed. If you see those cops and the tie-ups, you see the follicles develop. That should work. I know what's coming next. Eggs are coming next. Right, right. And that's the <laughs> only species where that never happened. So that's super frustrating. But to your point, I think a big healthy Boland's females they, they're going to lay two dozen eggs, 30 eggs, maybe even 35 eggs. Wow. And so when I see uh, Fred out in Sweden, or you mm -hmm. see um, the, down in Costa Rica, yeah. um, Quetzal doing them down there, yeah. the progress, like they've actually, you know, Fred's hatched babies multiple seasons. Mm -hmm. Unbelievably fantastic. They sell okay. in an instant for oh, 10 yeah. grand a piece, no questions asked. That's great, but that's not full success. Yeah. It's a step towards success, and he's achieving something that nobody else is able to do consistently. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But, like you said, to get half a dozen eggs or to hatch out three babies from an adult, that's, to me, that's not successful there, yet. Yeah, there's something. It's a step, and, and something's still so missing. When, but if, when he, you, if he hatches out 15 babies or 25 babies out of a clutch, then yeah, you're, moving. you're there. Right. But we're still, we're still, you know, you can drive a car with three wheels. You know, you take off one of the wheels and it'll, it'll get down the road yeah. and it'll scrape on the, the pavement, but it'll move without the one tire, but it's not really what it needs to be. Right, right. Right? So once we get all four tires in place and start racing down the road with Bolins, that that's when you're hatching full clutches. And yeah. I'm super excited to see that. Dude. And it's very, it's the most frustrating thing yeah. that of my reptile breeding career was to never take that step with the bullets. So do you think it's a male problem? Because if you're seeing... No, not necessarily because, again, from working with other species, if the female develops that much, mm -hmm. follicles are that strong, there's so many of them and they're that large, then usually you're going to get slugs, yeah, or something out of it. Hmm. That's true. That's true. You know. Yeah. Well, so it's crazy. In, in our pro exotics days, I mean, we I, would. I don't know, but <laughs> no, nobody knows. Nobody knows. <laughs> yeah. I mean, in our pro exotics so days, we would give tours. We had a 6,500 square foot facility, and I'd walk folks through. Like, you know, I, I said, focus, focus, focus. We still did monitors, and we still did snakes, and we still did rat snakes in addition to bows and pythons. So our focus was smaller. It wasn't super 
you know, singular. Um, so I would show folks, I would show, you know, hey, here's some cool geckos, here's some cool boas, it, you know, ball python city yeah. over here, yeah. and oh, check out these monitor lizards, but it always finished at the Boland's cage. Yeah, yeah. Every time, yeah. because that is the cream of the crop, that is the cherry on top, is to, to be able to pull out this big bowl, and most of the time the people getting tours are not reptile folks. Yeah. You know? So you pull out this big 10 foot or 12 foot snake, you know, you just like start pulling it out, and their eyes go, wow, oh, oh wow, holy gigantic. Yeah. Although there's much bigger snakes than this, well, but sure. to them it's like gigantic. And then I start showing like the iridescence, and they're like, and the heads wow. are so cool in, in person. The heads are amazing. They're, it's, mm -hmm. uh, it's a big, broad head. Mm -hmm. and, and here on the body, it's very iridescent, right? Rainbowy Crazy. colors on the black. Yeah. But on the top of the head, it it's looks like, like a piece of felt. Yeah. And it, I mean, it doesn't feel like that. If you, you know, once you yeah. touch it, it feels like a regular EA scale. But it has like a, a, a three dimensional yeah. kind of effect. And so it has this felty look. And again, ours were so cool and so mellow. So yeah, the, the cream of the crop of, of the, the cherry on top of the tour, pull out the bones, I could hand it over to the mom or the 10 year old and, yeah. and help them hold this big, giant, beautiful animal. And so that's how we always ended the tour was yeah. at the bowling cage. I didn't get into, you know, hey, we're not successful breeding these and they stump us and nobody yeah. can figure them out. They don't care about that. We just want to show them off. Yeah. Perfect animal. So that's my number one snake of all time. Uh, also my number right. one regret on the breeding side of all time. Okay. Yeah, once we take a step down from that, it immediately goes to the opposite end of the spectrum because then I love rat snakes after that. Yeah. Cocci, any of the porphyracea stuff, mm -hmm. and mandarin rat snakes. We just produced uh, our first clutch. First clutch of vulture. Vulture. Yep. Yeah. Oh, right on. Yeah, thanks. Way to go. I mean, Matt, Matt you know, we're doing, working with him, and he, uh, okay. he sent over a pair of adults, and we put them together. They're, you know, they're going. They're, we're great. We're, we're excited. We're hoping they have live babies. You will. Yeah. Gorgeous species, mm -hmm. fun to work with, and not hard to breed. Yeah, you know, it's it's a it's another it's a great choice for a breeding project. Yeah, we did them in tubs with you know cypress mulch, and we bred the heck out. Of them. I, I yeah. think, I mean, believe it or not, this is like pre-internet type days, so it's harder to verify at the time. But I'm fairly confident at one point in time we were the world's largest producers of porphyracea and mandarin rat snakes, oh, and maybe the rhino rat snakes, yeah. which was the other so one that cool, rounds out yeah. my group um, that I absolutely love. Like, I'd love to work with any of those. If That's I'd, awesome. That, we're we're working with rhino rat snakes. Yeah, species. we're working we're with all of that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's great. They're no they're brainers. Awesome. Yeah. They're amazing. Yeah, they're great. I get so uh, envious of, of like Matt's pictures when he posts oh, really gorgeous <laughs> mandarins and stuff. <laughs> I know. Oh, I mean, it just takes me back. It makes us just want to call them and then punch them. Cause we're like, <laughs> now I'm gonna owe you more money, like, cause we're gonna be buying that. And like, <laughs> yeah. So the, the mandarins, I, I loved working with those. That's a very, that's a different type of project than the porphyracea. Mandarin yeah. much more challenging, um, but gorgeous animals. Yeah. Um, breeding's actually okay with those. It was the babies getting the yeah, babies all started. started and all that, that could yeah. be the challenge. Um, but yeah, I mean, a great mm -hmm. simple pure cocci with just a gorgeous orangish red with the two black stripes. I'm huge in the Lattice Synctus. I mean, they're not the most expensive of our group. I really love the Lattice Synctus. That's the same thing Ryan says. You're I'm incorrect. Like, You're incorrect. <laughs> <laughs> I the just Cox like them. The is the best one. Yeah, I just like them. I think they're cool. The Coxeye was the original one that started coming in from uh, yeah. Germany. Okay. Um, and I remember, again, late 90s. But a lot of times, like, the first type of an animal that comes in it's like, okay, that's the base. And then you got like cooler and cooler and cooler subspecies or different mm -hmm. species, right? Yeah. And yes, you're incorrect because that's not how it works. <laughs> the the first one, the base animal, the cocci, is the best one. <laughs> okay. That's it. The Valentai or the Polkra or whatever. Uh, they're fine. Fun to work with. <laughs> cocci is the best. Double striped cocci. And we when, have those two. <laughs> when those came in, it was so challenging to get them. It was hard to get them. Mm -hmm. But uh, Klaus was releasing them only yeah. in two point ones, uh -huh. so you had to buy two males to get one female, and they were forty five hundred for that reverse trio. <laughs> so it was like <laughs> yeah. it was big boy money. Yeah. 
It was big commitment. You didn't know anything really about them aside from, yeah. holy moly, that's beautiful. Right. But yeah, I mean, we had to put a lot of money into buying multiple reverse trios. Mm. Um, and then eventually you breed them and you end up, hey, you've got more females and stuff. But, it, you know, that was, it was a big step to get into those because it was, that was a lot of money. It was, a, mm. a, you know, that's the opposite of an ideal trio that you want. Mm. There's two males for every female. But, you know, that was the only way you could get them at the time. So, you know, we did it and, and worked with them. We loved them. Um, they're, what was so interesting about the cocci and any of the lot of sanct- or, uh, por- uh, porphyracea stuff, including <laughs> lotta sancta and everything else, yeah. was the multi-clutching. Oh, yeah. So, so with, we're, you, we're, you we're like, we're, yeah, well, so we're, we're working on that, but we're like, man, this is like, are you serious? Is this really going to happen? So, go ahead. It's like a... Yeah, it's like a, a, an automatic thing when they multi-clutch. When you work with colubrids, king snakes or corn snakes, a lot of times you you know you can expect to double clutch them or maybe even triple clutch them sometimes, yeah. and that's fairly common in captivity. And so I expected the same thing out of mandarins and out of any of the colubrid stuff we worked with, but on the cocci. I mean, it was just clutch after clutch after clutch. You had seven in a year. We had, we did nine. Nine. We had nine That's in one season. Unbelievable. And so what it, what was happening was with colubrids, you typically <coughs> cycle them to mm-hmm. cool them down for the winter, right? Yeah. So we had in our facility, we had a room we pulled down to fifty five degrees, twenty four hours a day. We put our uh, colubrids in there. We put our helas in there, which, another favorite species. Um, but and that was the winter time. But inevitably, we'd have to watch the uh, porphyracea so close because inevitably some of the females would continue to cycle without males. They would, you know, develop eggs again, and you didn't want them developing eggs and laying eggs when it was 55 degrees. That was, wow. You know, that was dangerous for them. Yeah. We needed r- more regular temperatures. And so at, at one point, we, you know, we took half of the group maybe or something and, and said maybe we're just not going to cool these at all and see, what and see what happens and then it was just boom 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 clutch after clutch after clutch and and we found that you didn't have to cool them at all now nine clutches was was very taxing for the female yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. They, they'd lose weight they lose energy we you know you really have to feed her back but we weren't pairing up you know nine times to try and do that yeah they, it was just how they would just keep going and going that's unbelievable. Um, yeah, it was crazy. It, nine was the record. Yeah. But whereas, again, with corn snakes, we might see two clutches. Um, we expected to see at least four clutches out of every female. Again, not by choice, not because we're you know trying to hammer four clutches, but we're just we're breeding and we're going to watch each female because we're expecting that she'll probably do three or four clutches. So you don't, you know you don't want to miss the clutch. Mm-hmm. You don't want to miss the female lane so that you can. Give her the care and support and aftercare that she needs, yes. um, you know, hydration-wise and food-wise and everything else. So we had always ex- expected, you know, that while all the other colubrids are chilling in the colubrid room yeah. in the winter, we still have these cocci that, and other porphyracea. We had to keep watch on and, and yeah. to see that they keep clutching wow. and that's make awesome. sure we take care of them. It was amazing. It was an amazing experience. And, and again, that's one of my very top species that I miss working with. Yeah, man, that's awesome. That's that's great. Do you have any? And I'm, we're gonna wrap this up here in a minute. But do you have any uh, animals that you keep currently, like uh, you know, I like guess pets or I mean yeah. people do it sometimes. Two dogs. Two dogs. That's it. Those things are tough. Once uh, <laughs> well, once we once we stopped with pro exotics, and I started doing the shipping, started the reptile report, life changed differently. Yeah. And I I started traveling a lot more. For business, yeah, you know, and so I was on the road a lot more, and so it, it, and I didn't have a facility, yeah, so it became much more difficult to keep animals, right? You know, I find it. You guys probably have the same issue. Like, you keep a collection of stuff, well, then when you go on a trip, who's going to watch the stuff, right? <laughs> yeah, and I if you have somebody it. great that does that for you, awesome. But that's rare. Yeah, you know, you're usually asking a favor of a family member, a friend, or something, and. Mm-hmm. God forbid they do the wrong job or do a bad job or forget to water for a couple of weeks and you come home to sick or ill animals or dead animals. I mean, it, yeah. that happens. So yeah. when you travel a lot, it becomes very hard to keep 
Makes any sense. kind of a collection. And again, when you have 6,000 feet or you know 2,000 square foot or whatever your facility is, you have hundreds or thousands of animals, there's no need to keep anything at home. You, yeah. know, you see all these great animals every day. So that was always my experience. Yeah, and so sure. yeah, once you don't have a facility, it becomes a, a thing that you have to live through others. Yeah, and no, I understand. And that's cool. It's I mean, responsible, yeah. It's yeah, responsible. I enjoy talking to other people about their collections, about their animals. And seeing the pictures on the reptile report. I, yeah, absolutely. Mm-hmm. Seeing pictures and videos. I still like to have breeding discussion, mm-hmm. you know, with, with different people on how you breed or produce the animals. Uh, uh, Brandon at Rare Earth gave a, a talk at Tinley a couple of years ago about dwarf monitor species. Yeah. I was super stoked. I went to the talk. I sat through it and listened to it. I, I don't have any intention of keeping them again. Yeah. But it's still cool to keep the knowledge. Yeah, you just want to still keep up on it. So that's how I stay plugged in on the animal side is living vicariously through others. That's awesome. Well, I really appreciate your time. Um, sure. And uh, so people will be able to look up your, your new business soon. And uh, it's still... Yeah. Like, under, under, We're, under it's construction. So, it's so early. I mean, I have an email. Yeah. But we don't even have a website yet. Yeah, yeah. We're, oh, that's awesome. It's, it's coming stuff. up. Um, actually, the timing of it. So this is, we're filming Tinley Park Weekend, mm-hmm. or the ghost of Tinley Park Weekend. <laughs> Tinley and, Underground. We're yes. <laughs> there you go. Um, and so that, this next coming week was when we were going to start working on the website for redlinescience.com. So, awesome. uh, you know, if you're watching this a year from now, sure, you can go see the website <laughs> at redlinescience.com. Um, it's coming soon. Uh, again, new adventure, yeah. uh, new things, still in the reptile world. Uh, I'm excited about doing that. And, uh, you know, I'll still be at shows and still be as plugged in as I could possibly be. And like I said, you know, enjoy the animals through uh, the ability to support other people in keeping the animals that's and, and doing what they're doing. Yeah, that's great. Very rewarding. Awesome. All right. Well, thank you so much. And, uh, Thank you guys for watching. If you like this video, give us a little thumbs up down there. Hit the subscribe button. We'll be guys. We'll be putting links in the description below for everything you heard here, and uh, hit that notification bell if you like it. If you want to know when we're posting stuff. So, Robin, thank you so much. We really appreciate it. No problem, man. And uh, I hope this doesn't guys. give you anything like that. We're just, no. <laughs> you know how to sit on YouTube. Oh, I'll cut that. Cut that. <laughs> All right. So, thank you so much, and uh, we'll be talking to you guys. Again. So Tinley, man, it's, uh, you know, it got canceled. It's one of those epic things. People are trying to sell stuff out of their, their rooms and all that. It's a mess. Yeah, it's a mess. It it's a mess. mess. And we thought about not coming because we yeah. thought maybe it's going to get canceled. And uh, literally as we were landing, <laughs> I got a text from the promoter. Yeah. And he's like, dude, it's off. And I was yeah. like, so you could have told me this two and a half hours ago. That's what it, I know. And so now I'm I'm coming to Illinois for what I anticipate is going to be nothing. Yeah. Um, and it's it was a bummer to have it canceled. Like you said, you try and salvage it some, but yeah. it just fell apart. Uh, but it it actually reminds me that it must be 15 years ago. Um, we were doing the Daytona show. Sure. And there was a hurricane. A big hurricane that weekend of the Daytona show. And so we all came in on Thursday and it was pretty stormy. And then like Friday was the hurricane. And the show's, you know, Saturday, Sunday. Yeah. Um, and this was pre-internet. I mean, the internet existed, but it was pre-social media. There's no Facebook or anything else. Yeah. And so you, you weren't able to spread the word quickly enough. So everybody showed up to the show. And at that time, that was when Daytona was the big show. Yeah, yeah. You know, it was a monster show. And so, yes, so we were all at the hotel. And it's on Friday, and we had gotten into the building and set up. And just as the hurricane was starting to pick up, I mean, it's like super windy and rainy and stormy and crazy. And so we're all staying in the Hilton. Yeah, it's which, And it's a yeah. you know, big, tall um, You're like, hotel. this is smart. <laughs> And I've got staff there because we always travel with staff, you know, four or five guys for pro exotics to set up tables and animals and everything. And of course the bar area was packed and crazy. Yeah, hurricane party, that's what happens. <laughs> there was a couple of prominent reptile guys that, you know, had too much to drink and got into a fist fight. Uh, somebody tried to beat up Dave Barker, <laughs> which is, was nuts in itself. But so, 
I, I called my staff to, you know, because uh, I didn't see them. It yeah. It was a, a couple of guys. And I was like, where are you guys at? And they're like, oh, we're outside. And it's really fucking crazy and wild. <laughs> and I said, what do you, you guys got to come inside. That it's Nobody's supposed to be out there. Yeah. And then, uh, so after they had come inside, shortly thereafter, they, you know, they were like, you know, there were stop signs flying down the street, <laughs> like uprooted out of the ground. Yeah. And now they're just deathly projectiles. Yeah. You know, going by at 80 miles an hour. <laughs> I was like, you guys could have got killed walking out there, you know, being goofy and wanting to be out in the storm. Um, but then the crazy thing was they had to start relocating people in the rooms because on the top floors, the uh, balcony glass doors were being sucked out off of the rails. <laughs> like sucked off and then out into the world. Yeah. And so all the top floors were losing all their glass doors. Yeah. And then the rain was coming in, so it was flooding the top floors. We were on the fourth, fifth floor, so you know it was loud and crazy. But our room was safe. But yeah, I mean, they, we, they had people trying to relocate them, send them elsewhere, find them new rooms, so put them in the yeah. lobby because yeah, the top floors were becoming inhabitable, yeah. uninhabitable. Yeah. Um, so that was pretty wild. <laughs> Um, and but then you know Saturday was gone. Fairly mild weather. <laughs> Everybody's kind of in the daze, and sure enough, you know whatever ten thousand people showed up, we had a show. Uh, that's and so funny. It was the talk of the show. You know, the, yeah. everybody's talking about the hurricane show, but that's that crazy. was that was wild. And the timing of it was similar to the Tinley show. Yeah. Um, but it didn't end up canceling it. Uh, the hotel nice. got really messed up, but <laughs> that pretty much happens at every Tinley too. So the, the hotel gets messed <laughs> the up. The hotel does find, get messed up. We find lots of naked people in the hallways, you know, passed out. It happens. Never to me. Thank you. <laughs> I've never seen that. Oh well. <laughs> There's still hope. There's still hope. Yeah. So <laughs> this is the second kind of catastrophic show that I've been yeah. to. I've never gone to a major show. You know, one of the shows of the year where it's just been canceled. It, yeah. I feel terrible for the folks that traveled to the show, <sighs> made plans. Uh, I feel really too. bad for the small vendors. Oh, yeah, there's a, there's they a were, bunch. You know, they're banking on mm -hmm. a significant part of their yearly income. One of the crazy is going to be spring and is going to be fall tinley. The ho so people send in, you know, show booths and animals shipped to the hotel, and the hotel rejected them. So how do you get there? My animals are here. No, we turned them home. They're gone. And you're like, but I just, like, how am I, who's going to take care of my, look, like, and they're in shipping for, right? And how are they being returned? Yeah. I've been in the shipping business, so yeah. I know that if a package is stopped and returned, it often gets slow boated. Like, it'll be returned ground. doesn't matter where the service it got there. And so we've had to react to that a couple of times uh, oh, for shipping goodness. reptiles where, you know, some something happens that the package gets returned, and you got to bust ass to make sure that's put to overnight return. Mm -hmm. They're clarified that it's live animals in the box and not, you know, so it doesn't come back ground. So yeah. I mean, it's a that's a that's nightmare. Crazy. Um, and I, I do I feel bad. The yeah. big guys, it's a huge hit. Yeah. You know, for the the triple L's and the Pangeas, Reptile Basics. So, yeah, all that. It's a lot of money for the weekend, but those guys will be okay. It's the small boutique breeders, again, that busted their ass all year. This is one of the Worked hard years. to get a booth for the show, which is not easy. Yeah. And this is going to be, you know, this show is going to be where they're going to make a good amount of their reptile money for the year and then now nothing. That, yeah. and, and they're going to eat travel and they're going to eat hotel and they're going to eat plane fares or, you know, whatever else. Yeah. That, that one I really feel bad for and, and uh, I, hope, I hope that works out. Yeah, they're uh, gonna move it to right now. They're moving it to June, so we'll see how that works. Yeah, <laughs> we'll see. So, but yeah, yeah, there's still a world. Yeah, <laughs> no, <laughs> there's not. You know, Babu was uh, talking about he doesn't want to go to Detroit. We're asking him to come down, and he's like, "Ah, oh, zombie apocalypse happens. I don't want my zombies having guns, so we can't have that." <laughs> so, like, yeah, <laughs> thanks, Bob. It's it's a bit nutty. Yeah. So, uh, again, second show that's ever been canceled, or excuse me, second show that's had a catastrophe yeah. that I've been to. Um, first show that's ever been canceled. So it, it's been an experience. That's crazy. Well, thank you so much again, and I appreciate it. It's a funny story. So, all right, we'll, uh, we'll keep it moving. Hopefully we'll, we'll make something out of this weekend. All right, me too. Hope so. <laughs> salvage, salvage, salvage. Yeah.